So what I've been asked to do here today is to talk about uh, fall armyworm and the experiences so far in Queensland, which uh, have been largely confined to North Queensland. And for those of you who aren't fully aware of where fall armyworm is in Australia at this point, here's a map that describes that. And the important thing to note is the key on the left-hand side there that shows the blue dots. So all these locations are locations in Queensland where we have traps in place for fall armyworm. And the black dots show um, sites where the traps have been operating since March, but there have been no detections of moths. The blue dots show where there have been positive detections of fall armyworm moths. And the orange dots show where there have been moths and then subsequently larvae in neighbouring crops. The other thing that you will notice is that there are detections in the Northern Territory as well as in Western Australia. So there seems to be a bit of a hot spot of reports down around Broome. Uh, not so many of those have been confirmed at this point, but uh, I guess that's um, to be determined. It's likely that those uh, incursions, the one in Western Australia and the ones in Queensland may not have come uh, may not be related, they may have come separately from the north, from Asia somewhere, uh, but there's work going on at CSIRO to try and understand uh, how the populations that are currently in Australia are related. In terms of distribution in Queensland and the sort of numbers that are being detected, some of you might be quite familiar with trapping for helicoverpa where when moth numbers are high they can be several hundred in a trap over a week. These uh, next two maps just show you the cumulative count for the, the total trapping period through to early May for these traps. And what you can see with the, um, with the legend on the left-hand side here is that for the most part, the numbers are actually low. They're, they're typically uh, less than 20 moths for that whole period uh, for about a month. And it's, um, I guess that's, not unexpected given that this is an early, we were early in the incursion and there was a period through early April where there was a whole lot of traps in central Queensland that got moths for the first time, uh, which is probably indicative of a movement of moths rather than um, sort of brought about by wind, the passage of winds or some event that actually pushed those moths from north to south. And the most recent uh, detection of moths and then larvae was in Mackay in a trap in a corn crop there. And the most southerly detection of moths to date is still Bundaberg. Uh, so as you go further north, the numbers of moths uh, and the activity increases. And you can see that there, well, you could have seen if the slide was still there, um, that big red patch around Bowen. So Bowen and Burdekin are probably the most active uh, areas at the moment. And that is a result of um, both sweet corn and, and corn, but also sorghum earlier on. And there's been quite a lot of uh, experience gained in um, these areas over the last few months. So one of the most experienced people so far is probably Brent Wilson, who works with Nutrient Ag, uh, based in the Burdekin. And he, if you wanna see what's happening with fall armyworm, he's a good person to follow. And he has been drawing very heavily on his experience with managing helicoverpa to determine uh, when the right time is or wh whether there was uh, treatment needed for fall armyworm. The other thing that he's been learning a lot about is how to identify fall armyworm, which is no uh, trivial undertaking, and I'll move on to that later. But one of the things that Brett, Brent has learned is that uh, the damage the sort of defoliation damage you can see there on the top right can be quite severe, uh, but the ultimately the impact on yield uh, is tends to be minimal. I know in the last couple of weeks that he sprayed the very first crop, a maize crop, because it had very high uh, infestation. The infestation levels are still going up there in North Queensland. But up until that point, he had managed both maize and sorghum quite successfully without treating for fall armyworm. So when, um, when I mentioned that uh, identification of fall armyworm is not a trivial undertaking, one of the reasons is that it's quite variable. It's also very difficult to distinguish small larvae from a range of other larvae that might be present in the crop. 
uh, particular, particularly when you're in the north and in crops that host Spodoptera latura, that uh, is the case. So here's just a range of larvae. One of the things that does become a little bit easier is as the larvae get bigger, they do become quite uh, distinctive. They start to become a bit greasier looking, a bit more like a cutworm, not quite so hairy and the spots that are diagnostic become very clearly apparent on the on the rear end. So Brent's experience with fall armyworm uh, and the identification of fall armyworm larvae is really based on what he's been doing, which is collecting larvae, rearing them through for a little bit, feeding them on leaf material, and then confirming that they either are or are fall armyworm or something else. Now, I'll just put this up quickly just to show you that, you know, this is not a monster. Its reputation really suggest that this is a monstrously sized uh, caterpillar that's going to eat you out of house and home. It is in fact a bit smaller than Helicoverpa in the Lady in Stars, but probably a bit fatter and heftier. So uh, I guess that's the first thing to notice that this is not a, um, a disaster in terms of the other species that we are, are already familiar with. Some of the things that are being seen in the in the field that characterise fall armyworm, the laying of eggs in clusters and then the larvae emerging and uh, distributing them themselves through the, the crop. That sort of windowing on the lower leaves there is quite typical of Spodoptera, including this Spodoptera frigiperda or fall, fall armyworm. If you're familiar with um, Spodoptera latura, you're probably familiar with this sort of damage. The reason that uh, those larvae can spread so far and so quickly is that they balloon off from these egg masses. So they basically let themselves down on little silks that, and allows themselves to be blown in the wind, resulting in patches of plants that are infested at lower densities. At higher densities, almost every plant in the paddock is affected. So just some more images of the sort of typical damage that's being seen. One of the things that you would be familiar is the shot holing that we tend to see in both corn and um, sorghum when we have infestations of not only Helicoverpa but maybe some of the armyworm species. One of the things that fall armyworm seems to be doing that we haven't seen before with those species is that while they're in the world they perforate the leaf so intensively that large sections of the leaf fall off when uh, those leaves emerge. They seem to produce a, an inordinate amount of frass or poo, which is a really clear indicator that they're, they're active in the crop. And in fact, great big plugs of that frass are often evident in the whirl of the plant. So here are just a couple of um, pictures of larvae, a smaller larvae and a larger larvae, well entrenched. So these are whirls that have been pulled out of the plants, well entrenched, causing that, um, that feeding that then results in shot holing in the leaves. Uh, next slide, yep. So one of the things that I, I just wanted to mention is that uh, it's very important, given that there are a number of species of larvae that can cause very similar damage, that you check for larvae and don't panic and assume that it is fall armyworm and you need to intervene with insecticide treatments immediately. All these photographs here were taken on the downs in irrigated corn and not one of them is fall armyworm. So this sort of damage, the extensive damage in the top left there, was caused by multiple larvae. That's why it looks very much like fall armyworm damage because fall armyworm are typically multiple larvae per plant. We're not used to seeing that with Helicoverpa that just eat anything else that they bump into. In this case, it was northern armyworm or common armyworm there in multiples. So the pattern of damage is not the only indicator uh, of fall armyworm presence. And it's, uh, yes, I guess that's just what I wanted to say, that it's really important that if you think that you have unusual damage to make sure you get a good look at the larvae. The other positive, I guess, well, a positive, I guess, with fall armyworm is that when we went to North Queensland to look at infestations there in early, um, in May, in early March, we saw quite a lot of natural enemy activity. So these are things that we're familiar with from Helicoverpa and other uh, noctuid, so things like the armyworm species. Here we have a fungal pathogen, Nomurea rileyi, uh, probably more typical of tropical areas. Um, there's been some work previously done sort of further south that showed it didn't really hang around. But, uh, and then wasp parasitoids and fly parasitoids. We'd also expect that uh, there's a whole raft of predators that probably don't distinguish between a fall armyworm and other caterpillar pests in the crop. So I think we've got a lot um, 
a lot to look forward to in terms of those species that we're familiar with attacking uh, helicoverpa and armyworms and so on, um, readily moving over to fall armyworm and assisting with the control. While we're talking about control, there are a, a large number of permits now available for the control of fall armyworm, particularly in, um, well, in grain, but also in horticulture. This is the place to find them at the APVMA permits uh, website. Put fall armyworm into the search and it will come a whole uh, list of permits. Um, I think in, uh, I think late May I had a look and there were, there were 31, but I think there's probably a much smaller number of those for grains. But it now includes for corn, for example, um, Altacore, uh, Steward, Affirm, um, Success Neo, and then also uh, a number of older products that um, are sort of registered for helicoverpa in those crops as well. But it does raise the issue of resistance management and taking a cautious approach to the treatment of fall armyworm and only treating when required and giving some thought to the impacts of uh, insecticide use on helicoverpa because there are um, there is evidence overseas of helicoverpa of, of other species having resistance developed and I guess that's what we're concerned about uh, if there's sort of a you know, a mad panic to control fall armyworm with products that we would like to manage for helicoverpa resistance um, as per the helicoverpa resistance management strategy for grains. In terms of making those decisions about when it's necessary to control fall armyworm, because we haven't yet had experience in Australia with it and opportunities to do field work, uh, to do the trials that are required to establish thresholds where we're really referring to those that have been developed overseas and probably particularly in the US where the systems are, are much more um, familiar to us than perhaps some of the developing countries. So these are the thresholds uh, that are available um, in other material on fall armyworm and I guess when this is recorded you could go back and have a look at them. Uh, and I guess what, what I would say is so things like the helicoverpa, uh, the uh, fall armyworm threshold in sorghum you know, more than two larvae per whirl. So far, those sorts of densities haven't been experienced here, uh, but um, I guess we wait to see what uh, fall armyworm brings next summer. Pheromone traps uh, that are being used, I showed the, da the data for those earlier, or the, the uh, locations and detections. They're challenging to use. Um, if you're thinking about getting one, so you can keep an eye on what's happening, uh, it's not as straightforward as running a helicoverpa trap because there's a lot of bycatch. And this is a photo that Hugh took of the bycatch, well, of the catch that was in a trap from Bundaberg. You can see what a mess it is and trying to determine um, what's fall armyworm and what's something else <clears throat> is no mean feat. So we've prepared some information on how to sort those key bycatch species out um, <clears throat> and then concentrate on the, the fewer fall armyworm or fall armyworm suspects <clears throat> that might be there and get assistance uh, with identification of those. In Queensland at this point, there are a number of uh, entomologists who have had some training in terms of the identification of fall armyworm from moths in traps. Uh, that has to be done by dissection of the male genitalia. So um, anybody can learn to do it, but I guess at this point, uh, these are the people that may be able to provide some support. And clearly in New South Wales, currently biosecurity um, taxonomists are doing that. In terms of getting more information, um, as things develop and as uh, trial work is done and um, advice can be refined or improved for Australian growers, we'll be putting it onto the beat sheet, which is probably our main communication uh, vehicle. We've got a fall armyworm area now. We had a, a Q&A session with growers in central Queensland when they were a bit alarmed that Fall armyworm seem to have made a major move into central Queensland in early April, and you can listen to that there as well as a webinar like this one, probably almost exactly the same. Um, so that's probably a place to go uh, if you're looking for basic information um, and sort of current information on fall armyworm. There's also information, of course, um, on the DAF website that uh, I think probably the other state, well, the New South Wales State Department also has that, that information. And that's uh, it for me. Thanks, Zaritza.